Welcome back. Well, today we are going to get into one of my very favorite subjects ever. We're going to talk about language. I love language. And because language is flexible and living and it's always changing, it gives us such it gives us joy and it gives us frustration. And yesterday I asked for a list of frustrating words and I got several of them. So we're going to talk about them when we come back. particular order. Let's talk about some of the words that get on your nerves. Now, I'm not dealing with non-words or mistakes because, of course, we all get annoyed with mistakes. Than, T-H-A-N, confused with then, T-H-E-N, or there, T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E, as in they are, or there, T-H-E-I-R, as in belonging to them, or there, T-H-E-R-E, as in over there. Those are common mistakes. And we're not going to talk about mistakes. Mistakes annoy all of us. We're going to talk about, let's just say, interesting words, um, abused words. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. So, as I say, in no particular order, someone wrote in and said they really disliked the word crotch. Well, crotch, that's all that is. It's a fork. We have a crotch in a tree. Of course, we have a crotch in our pants. Um, this word is a great word, crotch. It's a very old word. It's been in our language for a long time. And it goes back to the shepherd's crook, you know, the rod that a shepherd used as they were you know, going through the fields with their sheep. I grew up in a city. We didn't do that. Um, crotch, crook. And the other related word that I'm sure you'll get right away is crutch. Because an old-fashioned crutch, and by old-fashioned I mean medieval, in the Middle Ages if you wanted a, crut, a crutch, if you needed a crutch, you'd cut down a branch of a tree that had a good crotch, cut it off, that's where you'd stick your arm, and you'd wander around with your crutch. All related words. Crook, crotch, crutch. And it all goes back to fork. So that was a word that just got on somebody's nerves. And words get on people's nerves. I remember reading about somebody who, I, I think it was he shot his girlfriend because he didn't like Mars bars. Just the word, not like he disliked the Mars bars. He didn't like people saying Mars bars to him. And his girlfriend just said, Mars bars, Mars bars, Mars bars. Hey, he got his gun and he shot her. It's like, okay. Um, I get annoyed about words, but I've never shot anybody over it. I've never even been tempted. So obviously some people can take it to extremes. Um, but I'm sure our the one who disliked crotch is not going to shoot anybody. So we should be fine. Um, another one, somebody had said forward, go forward, you know, reach your arm forward. And it's interesting because forward is not actually about direction. It's about futurity. Forward in Old English was forthworth, future, forth forward in the future. That's what it meant. So if we went forward, we went forward in time. It wasn't a compass direction. So that is somebody who is right on target. Although I do believe at this point we can all agree that forward, backward, um, we use them as compass directions now. But again, as I said, a language is a living thing and it's, it's moving. 
And we don't have to like the way it moves, but we have to recognize that it does move. Um, one of my own little mm, annoyances is decimate. And decimate is a delightful word, and it comes from the ancient Roman practice of when a general became annoyed with their troops, they would go out and kill 10% of them. Yep. This wasn't the enemy. This was the Roman general and his own troops. It's just, you've annoyed me, 10% of you, every 10th man, bang, off with his head. I know. And these days, our service people think they're hard done by? Oh, I don't think so. So decimate went from meaning to remove a tenth. And we get that from deci, the, the root deci, which is um, Latin. We get that in decimal. It just means ten. And it was every tenth man. And it's gone from a tenth to like an overwhelming, the, the bomb decimated the countryside. Um, I think, this is just my personal opinion, I think what happened was it sort of became amalgamated with devastate because of the similarity. Decimate, devastate, they have a similar sound. And devastate most certainly does mean to, you know, just crush your enemies or, you know, the hurricane devastated the community. So I had to get over that. I had to work to get over that because if you look up decimate in a dictionary now, it really does say, you know, um, to destroy a large percentage of. It's no longer that 10%. And it's become very far removed from that Roman general. Although uh, you really have to admire the power they had. Wow, those were people who absolutely knew how to wield power. Golly. Um, another one was disrespect. So, no quiz. Nobody's getting any marks on this. How old a word do you think that is? How long do you think the word disrespect has been around? 1630. If you had just left me to my own devices, I would have said it's recent because I never heard disrespect until maybe the 1970s, the 1980s. And it sort of came up with young people's culture. You know, you're dissing me, you're disrespecting me. And I don't want to say gang culture, but it's kind of street culture. That's when I remember it coming in to popular use. Oh, no. 1630. So disrespect has been part of our language for a very, very long time. And I would say given the fact that we're looking at close to 500 years, we have to accept it's a real word. It's not just something that, you know, young street culture brought into our, our lexicon a few years ago. Um, we've got another one here, and this is great. I saved this one for last, and that's snuck, as in the past tense of sneak. Now, of course, snuck is not a word. But, and I said I wasn't going to do like non-words or mistakes, but this one is such a great mistake, and it's a common mistake. Um, we have two categories of verbs in English. We have strong verbs and we have weak verbs. Um, a weak verb is uh, like uh, talk um, or file or record. Any word that we turn into the past tense by adding an ed on it. So he talked, he filed, he recorded. That's most of our verbs. Those are weak verbs, ed. We have strong verbs too. We call them strong because they resist change. And strong verbs are buy. Um, I buy something at the store. I bought something at the store. I think, past tense, I thought. And we have a lot of them. And when you stop and consider it, those verbs tend to be common verbs. They're in our language. 
it's hard to get through an hour without throwing one or two of them out, never mind a whole day. And that's probably why they retained their character, because they were just such an intrinsic part of everybody's vocabulary that they were able to tough it out. Um, interestingly enough, the way those verbs are changed, which is a vowel change, you know, think, thought, well, actually, yeah, there's, there are a few consonant changes in there too, but rather than the ED, that tends to be the way Arabic and Hebrew deal with their verbs. They'll have, the, the consonants will be stable and the vowels will change. And interestingly enough, there is historical evidence to indicate that Aramaic speakers may have hit the British Isles long, long, long time ago, and it's possible they brought that with them. We don't know, uh, because it's too far gone in the distant past. But snuck is someone's effort to make sneak, which is a weak verb, sneak, sneaked, turn it into a strong verb. Now, the interesting thing is when you leave little children to their own devices dealing with strong verbs, weak verbs, what children try to do is they try to take the strong verb and turn it into a weak verb. Mommy buy this at the store. I run away because they're used to the fact that most verbs are turned into past tense with an ED. So they try to do that to all verbs, and they have to be taught. No, it's by bought. They just have to memorize that over time. We all did. My favorite of these, and for those of you who are my age and, and spent time in front of a television, as I did when I was a kid, you may remember this. I got this from the Adams family, and it was slink, slank, slunk. So that's the conjugation of the verb to slink. And, of course, it's modeled on drink, drank, drunk. And that's where snuck comes in. We have a, a lot of odd little verbs like that that people will try to turn into strong verbs because they have some resemblance to other strong verbs. Um, uh, slink, slank, slunk, like I say, is drink, drank, drunk. Uh, sneak, snuck, probably something very similar. Um, we have some like dive and dove. Dove is a legitimate past tense of dive, but so is dived. And you will see that sometimes there are both. I would say if I had to guess that dove will probably go away and dived will probably take over because we tend to go for consistency. So some of the less frequently used verbs that, um, that you can, in fact, turn into the past tense either as a strong verb or as a weak verb, the weak verb will probably take over. Think and thought, no, I think that's with us for good. But, you know, our language is not perfect. It's interesting, but it's not perfect. But anyway, that's why I saved snuck for last, because... It's fun, and it's interesting that as children, we wanted to turn everything into a weak verb so it all made sense to us, and then as adults, we now grab a perfectly useful weak verb that just fits the pattern like it's supposed to, and we try to turn it into a strong verb. Hey. So, um, oh, I have a word origins, but before I get into that, I I did want to mention something. I don't think I've ever told you that uh, where I am living right now, and me and my schoolhouse, I've been here 10 years. And every year for the last 10 years, my yard has been invaded by a different animal. When I first came here, it was snakes. Uh, not surprising, the people next door to me um, are hoarders and their mother and father lived here before I bought the place. They were hoarders too. And when you have enough junk in the yard, you get vermin hiding in it and making nests in it. You get enough vermin 
and you're going to get snakes. So yard full of snakes the first year. And then it was groundhogs the second year. And then skunks. Baby skunks, by the way, they practically come out of the womb spraying, just so you know. They'll be this big and they can spray you. Uh, at one point I had 21 baby skunks all over my porch. Had to trap them all in cat traps and relocate them. Oh my goodness. But boy, were they cute. They were just the most adorable little things. Um, I had raccoons. The raccoons came in. They threw a party on my porch. I would, I would open the door and they would look at me like, what do you think you're doing? You go back in there, lady. There's nothing to see here. They were very brazen. Um, snapping turtles. Oh, yeah, I had to take them down to the creek. And it wasn't just one. It was three snapping turtles that summer. It's the only summer we'd had them. And, of course, you know about the peacock because we had to repair the lamp that the peacock roosted on. And that's when I had to find uh, a woman who had a peacock farm and her little grandson came over and caught the peacock. Bless his heart. Well, this year it's vultures. Yes, indeed. I have a pair of vultures. When they got access to the schoolhouse roof, when the roof was off and it was covered with a tarp, they made their way in there and they had little baby vulture eggs. So now there are a couple of eggs in there and they would like to continue to nest in my roof. Not sure what I'm going to do about that because I believe vultures are a protected species here. And if they are, well, I'm not, not that I'm planning on shooting them or anything like that. I just need to figure out how to deal with them and their eggs um, because they're probably a danger to the roofers. They can be aggressive. Well, they're vultures. I'm, you know, no one ever really thought of vultures as nice, warm, fuzzy, cuddly little things. Although I do believe that um, it's one of the French poets, Balzac, I think, um, used to wander the streets of Paris with his, his pet vulture. I'll have to look that up, but I do believe it was Balzac who had a pet vulture. So who knows, maybe if I can hatch those little eggs, I can raise them as pets, and I can wander the streets of Carlisle with two little pet vultures. But yeah, I, I love you. I'll wander the streets with you first. I think Audie needed to be heard from on that. Anyway, I've got vultures now. I'm going to show you some film of the vultures before we sign off. That'll sort of be our closing, a little bit of vulture film. And let's take a look at this now. Audie, be good. Oh, he's, he's going to go after the camera. I know he is. Come here. Come on. All right, no, he isn't. All right, good. All right, uh, sabotage. I like this one. A wooden shoe. The immediate derivation of sabotage is obvious. It comes from the French word sabot, which means a wooden shoe or shoes. The peasants buy, um, wooden shoe or shoes, the peasants buy, who can't afford the leather ones. There, that was awkward. The French turned sabot into the verb saboteur, saboteur, which means to do work badly or to destroy a plant or machinery willfully so as to win a strike. The word sabotage is relatively new in English um, and in other languages. It seems to have gained currency about the time of World War I, when this technique was strongly advocated by trade unions as a means of coping with management, and especially by that radical labor organization, the International Workers of the World. Uh, the French word sabot, in its workers' connotation of sabotage, has been said to come from the notion of peasants trampling down landowners' crops with their wooden shoes to show their independence by a sort of strike, but this interpretation seems rather more romantic than defensible. Sabo is ultimately from the Ara Arabic word sabat, which means sandal, and the way I've heard that was during the French Revolution, the peasants would throw 
their wooden shoes into the machinery because a wooden shoe would clog up the machinery very quickly and easily. And if they were caught, they were caught with a wooden shoe. Everybody had wooden shoes. So that's what I heard. Um, stenographer, her writing is combat. If a businessman has a stenographer, she will take his dictation down in shorthand, for the Greek words for the term are steno, little, or compact, and grapho, to write. But should he rate a secretary, then she should keep his confidences, for the Latin term secretarius means one who keeps your secrets. Um, upholsterer, he displayed the wares. In days long since by, I told you this is 1950, in days long since by, this word was spelled uphold, upholsterer, U-P-H-O-L-D-S-T-R-E-R, -E uphold, right in there, for the very good reason that this man was then a servant who would uphold the goods. That is, he held the goods up that were for sale so they could be seen by the possible buyers. Then later on, he became a person who was hired to make the goods look more attractive by decorating them or draping them in an artistic manner. Finally, he became our upholsterer. Oh, and let me mention, by the way, um, that I was talking about uh, the author of this book. And uh, where are we? It's ah, Wilfred Funk. And people were saying it's, that's the Funk of Funk and Wagnall, and that was in the comments. No, I'm afraid not. This is the son of Isaac Funk, of Funk and Wagnalls. So his father was Funk and Wagnalls, and he is sort of Funk Jr. Okay, now before we go, I'm going to show you some film of some vultures. Yeah, oh my, no idea what I'm going to do. Um, I, I actually do have to like call somebody and find out if, if they are endangered or protected maybe there are people who will come out and take the vulture eggs and do something with them and by something i don't mean make an omelet i mean like figure out how to hatch them or maybe they have some clue about where i can relocate the eggs to because if all goes well the roof is going to go on the schoolhouse and the vulture eggs are going to be trapped inside and I don't really fancy the idea of just leaving the door open until vulture eggs hatch. That's probably not the cleverest thing I could be doing. Although, I, I mean, I guess it could be done. The schoolhouse has a very nice wide porch. Maybe we can just leave the door open. It's not like the rain could get in. That porch is too wide for that. But I'm also not really sure I want vultures living in my schoolhouse. I, I don't know. It's just, yes, can you see him? His reflection is where, here. See his reflection in the bookcase? He just hopped up so he could take a peek out the window. So the photobomb kitty is with us. All right. Coming up, pictures of vultures. We've got our words. I'll see you all tomorrow. Please notice that is the vulture. There are two of them. I don't know if that is mother vulture or father vulture, but he or she, ah, there we are. There are the two of them. They are up here protecting those eggs. So we're going to have to figure out what to do about the vulture eggs because those birds are definitely big enough to create problems if they want to. And I expect if they feel their eggs are threatened, they're going to want to create problems. Apparently, 
when the roof was off, they managed to get in there and sort of create their own little nest.